Um, I'm in a band, I don't know if you know, but I'm in a music band, and the golden rule is never interrupt the guitar solo. So I just waited very patiently until the end of that little bit of music. Um, <laughs> uh, we're back, technical hitches are sorted. So, as I was saying, uh, Jean, who's originally going to present, uh, do this presentation about um, sustainability in Occitania, is unfortunately ill. But thankfully, we have a very able deputy, probably better than Jean. <laughs> Philippe Berthaud, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Philippe Berthaud, so I'm uh, Deputy uh, Director of uh, Comité Régional du Tourisme uh, uh, et des Loisirs d'Occitanie, the DMO, the Destination Marketing or Management of uh, uh, Organization, sorry. And um, as I said, uh, I'm replacing uh, Jean Pinard, the famous uh, Jean Pinard, who uh, is uh, unfortunately um, rather ill because he's got the COVID. S so uh, it was at last minute. So um, my English is uh, a bit uh, rusty. So uh, thank you for your comprehension. So let's let's speak and let's talk about uh, Occitanie Ray Tour. So um, mo modern uh, concept or modern uh, uh, touristic uh, offer. Uh, the the Occitanie Ride Tour is a, a real strategic ambition, is a real strategic positioning, with the ambition is to act con concretely at our level for, um, as I said, a, a, a more sustainable and more responsible um, tourism, and. Um, and of course, uh, the object is acting or working for um, for uh, avoid the main cause of uh, greenhouse gases in touristic sector, which is uh, transport. So the, the uh, idea is to make the train and the public transport the basis of our marketing positioning um, of what we say, the, the, the leading or the flagship of uh, Occitanie offer. Um, we, are, we are rather fortunate or we are lucky in, uh, in Occitanie, Occitanie region because there is a dense uh, railway, railway uh, network and we have also the benefit that uh, the region uh, who has the competence of transport uh, um, follow a very aggressive uh, strategy to promote uh, low carbon uh, mobility. So it's um, in that uh, it's part of the, the strategy that we build the Occitanie Ray Tour. And uh, we, we implement the Occitanie Ray Tour through uh, four steps. The first steps is uh, connect uh, Trans, uh, transport information to tourism information, which uh, it seems obvious, but uh, which is not uh, really available in most of uh, website uh, uh, destina desti uh, web website destination uh, in reality. So, uh, so we d we did it, and uh, it, it, it uh, we will see it function rather well. The second step, it's. Uh, uh, the general generalization uh, for all inhabitants of uh, one transport uh, offer, one euro transport, to the BNO, uh, thanks to region to the region, uh, it's a promotional offer to uh, to travel in Occ Occitanie uh, for one euro per train ticket, and uh, in the same way. Uh, we uh, create a leisure uh, discount card for tourists that give first really advantage or discount on all activities, all leisure uh, facilities. And uh, on the same time also, we mobilized all uh, uh, touristic, uh, all office, uh, touristic office in Occitanie to promote uh, and to relay uh, all low carbon mobility. And then, the step four, 
we launch the Oxygeny Ray 2. So when, when, we, when I said, when we spoke, when, when we spoke about uh, connecting uh, all uh, transport information and all uh, touristic information, uh, that means that uh, I'm on the, the Occitanie destination website and I'm just looking for a, a hotel in name, Jardin Secret. And as soon as I found the offer uh, that I want, uh, I can have directly connected all the transport information from, from, uh, to get there from the place of the departure. We, we also uh, uh, put a tab, a website tab, uh, focused on train with all the, the possibility to visit Occitanie uh, by train and it presents the Occitanie Ray tour. Then, um, of course, we, we connected all, I said, all uh, uh, accommodation and le leisure services to all railway st uh, train station, and uh, we, uh, we set up a, a reciprocity with the SNCF uh, website and your website. So as soon as you are going on their site, you have uh, uh, touristic uh, information also. And um, this is uh, um, an advert on uh, uh, Le Bien Euro, the, the one euro ticket. And uh, on, 2020, on 2022, we expect about uh, 2.5 million uh, billion euros uh, that uh, generate uh, at least 20 million expenses on all the territory. So it's, it, it's quite significant. <coughs> so how, how we market uh, the, way, the railway offer? Um, The idea is to present the Occitanie Ray map in the same way that uh, Paris um, underground map. And uh, so you see that uh, they connected uh, all uh, very uh, famous uh, touristic point, uh, touristic uh, attraction on, on the map. And so our object is to first um, name all the train line with destination, like uh, um, <coughs> Le Canal du Midi uh, train, or uh, Les Seven train, or uh, La Camargue train. And each station uh, will have the, the famous uh, site or attraction of the destination, um, like uh, Pont du Gard station, or uh, Cassoulet station, or Carcassonne station. And this is the way we will uh, market it. The idea is to to, to do a bit like, uh, it's our model actually, it's a uh, jump in our model actually. It's uh, the, the Grand Tour of Switzerland where all the ski resorts are linked to uh, either leisure or either accommodation. So our, our strategy, uh, communi uh, our communication strategy. Sorry. Our communication is based on a concept, a strong value specific to Occitanie destination, which is Occitalité, so in English, let's say Occitality, which is a neologism that combines the value of hospitality, conviviality, friendliness, and and. Uh, um, Authenticity and uh, occitality um, meets or responds the new high expectation of travelers. Uh, it's it's a kind of um, state of uh, um, state of mind. It's a bit like uh, let's say uh, you know in Denmark you have the hug. I, I don't know if it's a good pronunciation. But it's, uh, it's like uh, la dolce vita in Italy. So in, in Occitanie, it's Occitality. Occ 
So the um, so the communication is based on on, on three um, pillars: um, occitality, diversity, and responsibility, which is uh, really the sustainable tourism. And um, the universe of the communication um, that embodies the notion and the Im imagination of travel with a signature, which is a, a travel that makes you grow, l'Occitanie, le voyage qui vous fait grandir, a promise, le fabuleux voyage d'Occitanie, the fabulous Occitan journey, and uh, um, a leading product, a flagship product, uh, which tends to, to be the, the, the star product of the, the Occitanie, which is the Occitanie Rato. So let's, let's speak about this uh, star product. In addition to, um, to all that, uh, the Occitanie Rider is, first of all, the, the star product for exploring the region by train and coach, of course. And um, the promotion of ride tourism is uh, definitely more responsible, more inclusive, and more sustainable. And th the possibility of reconnecting with the very essence of travel, the e encounter that illustrates the promise of the fabulous journey. In addition to linking the territory and connecting the region tourist uh, sites and activities, the uh, Occitanie Ride Tour will, in time, consolidate the origin, uh, the Occitanie region leadership position in terms of uh, such sustainable, such <coughs> sustainable uh, development, keep some uh, line with the uh, high tourist poten potential in operation. Uh, we, we um, yes, well, and encourage the, <coughs> the reopening of certain line, such as recently the one of the right bank of the Rhône, the one from uh, Pont Saint Esprit, Villeneuve et Avignon, and Nîmes. And above all, and this is probably our main object, is definitely to attribute train travel to the Occitanie Sud de France destination. I, I, I spoke about that uh, later on. We, we, are, we are lucky because we have a very dense rail network. And uh, in that case, uh, the Occitanie Rail Tour make it <coughs> possible to, first of all, build a range of sustainable holiday around the four destinations of an universe, uh, which is uh, sea, uh, mountains, countryside, towns. According First, uh, the themes, uh, Occitanie, right to, uh, for discovering vineyards, rugby fun, U U UNESCO sites. The season, the Occitanie, right to, for the beach, for winter sports, for festival. It's possible also to install uh, an image for each station. Uh, I spoke about it, uh, you know, named all railway station with the famous point or touristing point uh, uh, in Occitanie. And then assign activity or special activity or visits to each route. <coughs> so in reality, Occitanie Ray Tour is becoming a real touristic product on its own, comb combining ray tour with uh, activities, accommodation, with services, uh, I said it, uh, with, um, with and, and the sale of the pass for, for uh, one more day, allowing uh, you to travel through the regional railway. Uh, it will also allow us, and that will be our job, to, to be uh, something like holiday advisor with uh, um, a tall uh, number, numéro vert in French. So Occitanie Ray Tour, it's a, a B2B offer that will become the, the unique offer of uh, Le Certe, Occitanie, the GMO, 
is our main product, uh, our, our flagship. And a, a, a completely open B2C offer in terms of uses and a complementary offer to airline offer. Uh, as soon as you, you can arrive in Occitany through uh, Toulouse Airport or Montpellier Airport, then you can visit all Occit Occitany through, uh, through the uh, Occitany Ratio. The Occitany Ratio is, will be promoted uh, through uh, one, uh, one clip on, on all the TV and, uh, and um, <coughs> networks. And uh, we recently uh, did with uh, Michelin uh, a special guide, uh, Voyage en Occitanie, uh, presenting all the thematic tour that you can find in, Occita in Occitanie. And that was a, a bit um, tricky because um, um, historically, uh, Guide Michelin was promoting road to sell tires. And today they are uh, investing uh, train travel. So it seems that sustain sustainable transition is on the way. So I'm glad to see that too. Thank you. interested that um, certain airlines, like Delta, I think, has got this thing, system now where they coordinate with the local uh, <coughs> railway network so that the planes come and they, they, they make sure that everything is, is seamless, the, the, the transfer between air and, and rail. That is the future. I mean, I, I come from the UK where the rail network should be so much better. It's the answer. Yes. Uh, well, it, we, we are not ready yet, but uh, it will. Uh, in, uh, actually, in Occitanie, in Toulouse, it, it works rather well. When you are arriving at the airport, then the, the connecting for all the reasons is, is good. In Montpellier, it's, it's still uh, in, uh, in construction. Yeah, yeah. Well, I arrived in Montpellier. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, the principle is exactly right. I'm so yeah. pleased that you are, you are doing this, because we know this. It's a hell of a lot greener than anything else, any other way that we travel. So long live rail. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. For the, thank you for standing in. Oh, question, question, question. Go on. Yes, Do you have a specific solution for the Can you please remind me? Sorry. Did you have a, a, a specific solution for the mobility when you arrive in the railway station? After for, because uh, we always speak about the the last kilometer. But we know that the, this is not one kilometer. No, yes. This is the main problem, actually. Uh, um, we, we, all destinations are working on it. Uh, and that's why we, we try to mobilize all the uh, touristic office. And uh, so in, in, in each destination, there is solution uh, through uh, um, electricity uh, um, bicycle, for example. Or I, I know that in, in some area, there is a special taxi company, electric taxi company, who propose any services from, uh, from the, the railway station. And there is some uh, mountain station also who put uh, coach bus between airport and the station. But uh, there is a, a lot of job to do, yes. Yes. Question, can we give the microphone to the gentleman there? Hello, um, uh, I'm Pierre Cuvelier. I have uh, tourist accommodation in uh, in Nîmes, um, and I was wondering what is your uh, strategy for people like us that sell uh, accommodation in di um, different uh, places in in the region. Um, the tourist office in Nîmes is doing a, a great job, uh, sending me people directly that comes um, and. Uh, but I have um, I haven't heard anything from you guys. It's a pity. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry about it. Hey, it's my fault. It's not <laughs> your fault. <laughs> no, it's, no it's, my, it's our fault also. Yeah. So, uh, do you have any strategy for for providers of uh, you know um, lodging for you know in 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 the region? So we, yes, well, actually, I, I will not uh, define or, or present all uh, our strategy, but. <laughs> Anyway, in your case, 
you know, we, 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 uh, our specificity is to, 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 to work or to, to, to try to, uh, to uh, encourage all uh, uh, regional customers to, to consume leisure and, uh, and touristic accommodation. And, it, and it's in that case, we, we, uh, we built this uh, um, card, pass card that uh, I spoke about it. And, uh, and if we are partner on that card, that means that all Occitanian customers can come at your hotel through all the adverts and the publicity that we are doing. So it's one of the strategy. Are you happy with that answer? <laughs> are you sure that you are happy? <laughs> Very good, Philippe, thank you so much indeed. To Philippe Berto, please. Okay, apologies if you didn't hear me before, I was talking off mic uh, and I've been quite rightly told off for that because people are watching by, via streaming. I was just saying it's so important to have a integrated uh, rail network system. I think that is the answer for all of us, particularly in, in land countries with big you know, land areas to cross. Um, so I'm all for that. Right. I think today has been really, really interesting. I don't know if you were here this morning, any of you, but the sessions have been right on the button. I mean, talking about communication when it comes to trouble, uh, talking about with, with Duncan, talking about the, the way that we approach the whole notion of travel, and again, trying to communicate the positive aspect of how it can actually be beneficial for the environment. That's the way to look at it. Uh, not to be, I guess, apologetic all the time for what travel <coughs> can also do, but that's what this very conference is about. Let's go to another very pressing topic and that is um, protection of the environment and how we deal with that. Um, I have somebody here who's going to chair this panel, Daniel Turner, who's the director of Annie Mondiale. Is it French, um, Daniel? Is it? it sounds French. <laughs> Annie Mondiale, I think you can. Uh, uh, you used to work for Born Free, yes. yeah, which is a, a very good, uh, again, protection charity. But we're going to talk now about, again, how tourism and animal protection, or conservation generally, can work together. So, Daniel, can you come up and introduce the panel, please? Daniel Turner, everybody. so much for coming and uh, apologies but I'm going to be speaking in English and hats off to all the French speakers for persevering in English it's really embarrassing for me um, this session is focused on tourism's impact on nature conservation um, and it is a new topic for travel and tourism but it's certainly not a new topic uh, for the world and before I introduce the speakers and ask them to come uh, up and sit down, I just wanted to give you a, a kind of an overview as to where we are at. Because... Daniel, it's a hitch with this slide, so you're gonna... I'll, I'll persevere. <laughs> um, so I just want to give you a kind of a snapshot as to where we are, because uh, we are at a crisis point. And I know that the conference has been very much talking about climate crisis, um, but I would tend to challenge the fact that perhaps the biodiversity loss crisis is more profound and more urgent. So nature is the very fabric on which all uh, life is based um, on Earth. <coughs> Uh, it's essential to human existence. It provides countless ecosystem services on which we all rely. And it ensures our means for achieving net zero. Nature includes all non-living materials, such as soil, water, air, and all living things, from bacteria to blue whales, referred to as biodiversity. 
Travel and tourism is intrinsically linked to nature. Over 80% of travel and tourism goods and services are directly or indirectly rely on nature's resources and functioning ecosystems. The popularity of nature-based tourism <coughs> grows year on year, <coughs> currently representing 50% of travel and tourism's market share. It generates annual revenues of upwards of 600 billion US dollars a year, supports millions of jobs, provides opportunities for countries to grow and diversify their economies while protecting their biodiversity and natural heritage. Across the world, travel and tourism not only funds protected areas um, and, and conservation action, but it uh, also helps uh, local economies restructure a way that benefits both people and planet. From gorilla trekking to wildlife safaris to whale watching, travel and tourism has shown its potential to create win-win scenarios that access multiple targets, both in the um, 2020 biodiversity framework, which we will talk about in this session, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Yet, if poorly managed <coughs> by not considering potential impact on the natural world, travel and tourism can contribute to all five drivers of biodiversity loss. Those are the degradation of wild spaces um, when you convert them to usable spaces, the unsustainable sourcing of wildlife, climate change that disrupts and destroys ecosystems, uh, pollution from single-use plastics to pesticides, and the introduction of invasive species. And so tourism contributes to all five, or can contribute to all five. Globally, current demands on the natural world are equivalent to the output of 1.6 Earths imposing an ever-growing strain on the biosphere and causing unprecedented global declines in biodiversity. We learned earlier this month from the Living Planet report that since 1970, the abundance of wildlife has declined by almost 70%, and one in four species is facing extinction. Allowing this downward path to continue will not only mean we lose the solution to lessen climate change and prevent pandemics, um, it will also mean a demise in travel and tourism, a demise in the health and well-being of ourselves, and literally an end of life as we know it. The good news, and we are coming to the speakers, the good news, uh, is that uh, the sector is fight, fighting back. Anne Mundial is working with the World Travel and Tourism Council. We have published a report <coughs> called Nature Positive Travel and Tourism, which provides our sector with all it needs to minimize our dependency and impacts on nature and to contribute to the biodiversity protection and recovery. Today, I'm joined by experts in global and regional tourism, as well as carbon and uh, consumer intelligence to explore tourism's impact on nature, the challenges and the solutions. If I could ask Michelle, Denis, uh, Christelle and uh, Kit, oh, Kit to come on to the stage, please. Thank you. Right, so I know it was a fairly long introduction, but I felt that it was important because when, when we, uh, for that report that I mentioned, we consulted over 200 businesses, travel businesses, and we, we found that actually majority of people really didn't know what 
nature was, what biodiversity was, and the, the current situation that we're in and what that could mean to travel and tourism. So hence that introduction. Um, so we learned that travel and tourism is both a friend and a foe of nature, driving and supporting uh, nature conservation, but also contributing to the five drivers of biodiversity loss. Michelle, in your role, I hope one of those, those work down there, um, in your role as special advisor uh, on tourism to both uh, the French government and UNWTO, um, recognizing that we have multiple crises, climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, potential next pandemic around the corner, which crises are most important? This is much more than an introduction. It's a, it's a lobbying uh, introduction. I, because you, you give the answer at the same time you give the, the, the question. But uh, clearly, um, we know that we have a crisis. We know that the situation is complicated in terms of climate. We all recognize that. But um, I really think that uh, we have to learn and to observe the, the reality um, with the real figures of the impact of tourism. Um, and uh, we have to, to learn and observe again uh, what the customer is uh, waiting for, because we have what we hope. And after, we have the reality of the business and the reality of the sector of tourism. This is the first point, because I really think that when you say um, a huge impact on the biodiversity, this is the, your first uh, introduction. I will say that we have to measure better the impact on the biodiversity. Uh, if you allow me, I'm going to, to give the example of uh, Canada and um, in Quebec, the CEPAC, who is the organization of the natural park, national parks in, uh, in Quebec. They decide 15 years ago to organize the parks for tourism. And at that moment, they had an objective to multiply by six the number of tourism, from one million to six million. They decide to organize the accommodation of tourists. They decide to put a maximum of tourists at the same time in the park. But they organize all the services. They put accommodation with Utopia. I'm CEO of Utopia International. And at this moment, they buy 750 tents, Canadian tents, manufactured by French guys. And at the end, now, they receive more than 6 million tourists. But what they did is to invest all the revenue on conservation and protection and to measure the impact on biodiversity. What is very good, and it's a, um, an incredible result, the biodiversity had increased. So we have a, a real example of when you manage tourism, and I'm not speaking when you stop tourism, when you manage tourism, you are able to protect, to conserve, and to measure the biodiversity and the environment. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I mean, um, I think there's lots of examples, and the certainly the uh, gorilla trekking uh, in Uganda, Rwanda, uh, has demonstrated how tourism can really um, bring back uh, a species that was on the brink of extinction. So there's definitely some good examples. And personally, a great advocate of travel and tourism continuing, but in a responsible way. And we, we all believe in that, yes. right? And this is what UNWTO is working on, is how to do a cleaner 
uh, tourism, uh, cleaner transportation, cleaner accommodation uh, is clearly uh, to be able to, um, to organize it and to have the sector thinking of what we have to do in the next future. Exactly. I want to just go back to um, the fact that, I mean, yesterday we heard a lot of people talking about climate change. And I was sitting on the front row of all of those presentations, kind of listening for the N-word, nature. And it really didn't uh, show up in the conversation. So I just want to explore that with Kit. Um, Trust Carbon provides an intelligent platform for businesses that seek uh, effective decarbonisation. Um, we know that climate change is a driver of biodiversity loss, but we also know that biodiversity loss is vital to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Are they two crises or one? Uh, um they are two crises, but they need to be thought of as one. The, the biggest threat um, in the sustainability industry right now is that we solve climate change and we don't solve the biodiversity issue. Because you know, if we get to 2050 and, and we all turn around and say, wow, okay, we, we managed to get rid of all the carbon and cool the earth, great. But then, you know, fish stocks in the ocean are, are still down 90% on, on 100 years ago, which is just an insane statistic. Um, insect um, biomass is down, I don't know what the percentage is, you probably do. But it, again, it's, every time you see a statistic related to biodiversity loss, it's terrifying. A quarter of animals are at threat of extinction, you mentioned at the start. Just, so we could, we could solve the climate crisis and, and still have a, a whole, equally life-threatening or, or species um, extinction level threatening crisis for, for the human race. Um, so we have to think of them as the same thing because the fight is on for, for both of these at once. Um, the, the clock is ticking and, and we, we can't solve one and then move on to the other one. <coughs> just, there is not time for that. Um, Sadly, we're at risk of losing both battles, so we, we have to go all in on, on, on them. And then the best solutions to, to climate change are ones that, that solve climate change and solve biodiversity loss. Um, you know, th there's, a, there's a lot of, um, quite rightly sometimes, criticism around offsets that are, that are nature-based. Um, partly due to measurement problems and verification problems. But if they are done properly, then we can sequester carbon or protect forests, um, and in doing so, protect ecosystems and, and protect biodiversity as well. And, and the same for blue carbon as well, protecting oceans, creating new mangroves, whatever that looks like. And, and it's just such a great way of, of increasing biodiversity. So the best solutions are ones that can combine both and look at both together. Yes, and, and actually the most biodiverse locations absorb the most carbon. So that is an indication that work should be done to improve or boost biodiversity, restore nature, and you are ultimately going to be absorbing more carbon. <coughs> and it's free, which is, you know, Business, business case, right? So um, do you feel, just by what you just said, do you feel that biodiversity is often left out of the conversation? Is that your, I mean, that's my opinion, but do you think, do you think that? Yeah, yeah, I, th there's no question. And it, it's funny because on one hand, the the externality of, of carbon is is um, greater than biodiversity loss, right? So, so if you took a flight here, um, as you know, guilty as well. Um, if you took a flight here, then then you have emitted carbon, and, and that's going to do its its little bit to, to warm up the atmosphere, right? Um, the you, you're never going to notice what that that warmth warm, warming effect is, right? But um, 
in, until you know 50 years time and, and it's the, the concentration of all the warming effects of every person on earth. Um, whereas biodiversity, you, you, you can see it, right? You can see when a forest gets chopped down, you can see when something unsustainable happens. Um, if, if you've been following what's happening in the Alaskan crabbing industry at the moment, um, you're, you're not gonna be able to get Alaskan crab for the next couple of years, right? So um, you, you will see those effects much quicker and much more obviously. And, and so it is funny that the conversation is, is so much about carbon, um, rightly so, but that we're not lifting up biodiversity to the same point. So I don't, I don't think we should bring car the carbon conversation down, but I think the, the biodiversity conversation needs to be brought up to the same level as well. And I think you made a, a great point there that you know, we, don't, uh, we don't need data, which is often seen as the, the issue with biodiversity. We don't need data to appreciate nature. Uh, and that's why I want to come on to Christelle, um, Deputy Managing Director of uh, uh, Savoir uh, Mont Blanc. Um, I would say it's, it, I mean, it's fair to say that nature is probably your greatest asset. Um, do you consider nature in the context of your decarbonisation mandate? Or do you see it as a, 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 small, a lesser or greater va value? Um, our territory, Savoie Mont Blanc, ha is famous for ski resorts. You'd think skiing and sports is the main thing coming to our territory, but actually it's nature that's the number one trigger and the one number one thing that people want going to the mountains. So nature is our asset. It's actually our playground. We are the first destination for outdoor activities as well. So it's, it's about reconnecting to nature. It's about breathing fresh air and pure air. It's about contemplating nice vistas in the first place. And then it's about playing sports. So we actually see that there is a, a shift in population as well. So you have the ski fans like I am. And then you have also the nature fans that are coming to our mountains, especially after COVID. We've seen a lot of new hordes of, of tourists coming to the mountains that may not have the codes or the culture of how to behave in the mountains. And that's where national parks and natural parks, for instance, come into play, where they are there to preserve nature, biodiversity. Actually, we have a national park that's been created 60 years ago, like in Quebec, the Parc de la Vanoise, um, created to protect the ibex um, in the first place, the, the big white goat with the big horns. Um, and these people actually are there to tell you not to camp anywhere, not to pick up the flowers, not to pet the dogs that are actually you know, shepherds for the cattle in the in the Alps. So it's about explaining all of that in a positive way to tourists. And I think it's our duty as an industry to carry these messages as well as all the fun you can have skiing. And um, we talk about that in the summer uh, in, the, in the parks, but also during the winter. Um, for instance, Les Arcs, which you might know, which is one of the top 10 ski resorts in the world, is in Savoie Mont Blanc. And they've, um, they are in the Vanoise Park, actually. And they've created uh, like a, pr a protection zone for the black grouse, a bird. Um, they've actually planted a thousand trees by the slope so that they protect um, the skiers from going into the nesting area. And until the, the trees have, have grown, there's panels explaining to the skiers that they shouldn't ski in the, in the puff over there and actually stay on the slopes. And how is that generally received by by the public? I mean, obviously you're, you're providing interpretation, you're providing opportunity, you're providing communication. Do they take that on board in a positive way or do they sort of question and try and get around the, uh, the barriers? You always have rebels anyway. Uh, but no, I think it's, it's about being positive. And if you do it in a fun and light way and not in a very like dark and, and, and forceful way, it should work. Well, I think that's what we're gonna try. And, and that's what I want to ask Denny about. Um, your company, G2A, provides data um, to, um, on ski and beach destinations in France, Italy, Switzerland, and Austria. Um, an insight of 120 million uh, tourist nights per year. Amazing. Um, what, what are people talking about? Do tourists appreciate nature? Uh, in introduction, I'm so sorry, I, I'm not confident in my English, that's why I have my phone, but I have good news for French people here. I speak with a terrible French accent. It will be easier for you to, <laughs> to understand what I mean, what I say. 
Uh, yes, in line with the uh, first intervention, intervention, the first very striking element uh, in the evolution of the number of people integrating environmental awareness av uh, in their choice of holidays is, is very important. We um, have the habit to interview uh, seven, uh, sev well, 70 uh, thousand uh, people for the four main European markets each year. And in 20, uh, 62 of respondents uh, were integrating environmental awareness in their choice. Uh, there was 83% in 22. 62, 83. And, uh, but already 89% among for 18 to 25 years old people. Uh, but be careful. Intentions do not mean action. Uh, that's one of the reasons uh, why we are co-constructing a new observatory of desirable futures in tourism in a few months, I hope with you. <laughs> uh, for example, this observatory should make it possible to measure the gap between the intentions and personal or collective action of tourists themselves and uh, of the territories. Uh, the reason for the choice of destination in summer and in winter uh, are not exactly the same. Uh, it, it, it would be a good thing for Sauvignon Mont Blanc. <laughs> uh, the three main ones in winter are for 46% uh, 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 of people, landscape and environment, and fresh air. Then a third to disconnect and recharge themselves, and the unspoiled nature influences the choice of only 18% uh, of people. The main ones in summer are landscape environment for 56% of respondents, then silence, and finally fresh air. For summer, their choice takes account uh, to the unspoiled nature for a third of people, almost twice as much as in winter. And I don't speak only, not only about mountain, but uh, all the, the area. So just back to uh, Christelle, we, we are getting a, a sense that people do care. Um, I suppose the question is, do they take that information and then apply it? Um, it's just interesting, the, there's, I mean, there's lots of data around. We've got um, the Economist uh, Information Unit. They polled um, people in uh, 50, 54 countries. This is in 2021, uh, covering 80% of the world's population. And they found that people very much care about nature and what businesses in particular and governments are doing to take action. So could you give us an insight as to what you're doing to, you've talked about some of the things, but you, um, as far as a allowing people to make informed choices. Um, uh, one thing about nature is probably talking about it a bit more. And um, on our social networks, we're actually the first mountain destination kind of ecosystem in a digital uh, world. We've got four million people that we animate each month, for instance, it's uh, talking to them about the nice pictures and the groundhog, and they love that, and the algorithm in Facebook loves that. But then it's also telling them about the different national parks and the different uh, educating them about nature, that kind of thing. So we have to bring that into our edit editorial line on the network, so we kind of make them aware of the topics. And then on a practical level, so it's not nature, but it's carbon footprints, and I'm allowed to talk about it. Um, we've identified that 70% of our uh, carbon footprint for is, is um, actually transportation coming to our resorts. And uh, so we've just launched, um, so we don't have a magical uh, stick, but we've launched a platform that's called Go Savoie Mont Blanc with uh, Antidotes, which is a, pla uh, um, 
Savoyard startup uh, from Savoie. And it's about um, making an informed choice on the transportation. So you enter point A, you're leaving from Brighton, for instance. You're going to Val d'Isère or any of, the, of our resorts. It tells you which uh, combination of transport you can take. And it brings up first the least carbonated option. So you see it first. You can see the cheapest and the quickest, but you also see the greenest. And that's what we put forward first. Um, so we kind of educate people and we nudge them to take the right decision. We hope they will take the right decision. Um, so and then we, moni we will monitor, you know, how many people book through that, and then we can push them activities when they are on site, etc. So we hope that that's going to um, be a success, and that all of the territories and the resorts actually use that tool as well themselves. And one plus one plus 112 might make a difference on our carbon footprint. So I suppose the question now is, um, is it right for members of the public to kind of lead everything? The sort of onus is on the public to do the right thing, make the right choices, um, not to have that impact. And I was just this morning in uh, the Novitel over the road. Uh, this was hanging on the door, and there's no information about what the hotel's doing on, on nature and, you know, planet's resources, and it says you can help uh, the planet's, uh, protect the planet's resources. You will, um, we will follow your lead. And it's obviously talking about uh, how, you know, what to do with your towels and all this sort of thing. I suppose the question is, shouldn't businesses and governments be leading and advising the, the consumer what to do and what not to do? Michelle, that one's for you. Yes, of course. <laughs> this is the, the answer. Uh, what is very important, I think so, and I think that the governments and territories have to work on it. We are speaking about... We are speaking about um, conservation and sustainable tourism. And uh, I really think that conservation is... a uh, natural, cultural conservation of our heritage. And we, we speak from the beginning on uh, the carbon impact and the environmental, but uh, governments and, uh, and territories, they have to find uh, a new model of tourism with an economical part and at the same time a social part. And because clearly what we, are, um, what we are doing, and it's a need, and we have to, to, to push on that, on the environmental part, is going to be more expensive. It's going to be more difficult to come and to arrive on tourism destinations. We saw it clearly right now. And um, I always remember that more than 35% of French people are not going on holiday. So we do not have to forget that people want to go on holiday the increase of people traveling in the world is going to increase. So we are not able to stop that because this is the humanity who wants to move all the time. So we have to manage that. And this is why it's important for government and, and destination to think about it. When you are speaking about that, where in Utopia, we are working on where we can develop an economical, uh, a sustainable tourism and destination, trying to train people in the area, trying to work with the people in the area, being reversible, being light. We have everything on that. We are educating our customers. All the activities inside our sites are based on um, educate people on the nature environment. And after, we push people to go and to visit the village. We want them to consume within the, in the outside of our um, uh, sites. But after, do we really, um, are we really able to do that? Well, you have to look the reglementation in France and in other countries. You have to, to look if what we are saying is really what we are doing. And there is a huge difference. I gave last week uh, this, uh, this example, but I'm, I'm going to say it again. In France, if you want to do a natural camping in the nature, 
it's impossible. The regulation forbid to create a new camping if you do not have a continuity with urbanism. So you have to do it in the village or in the city if you want to create a, a natural village. So today we can say all the morning we have to create a natural environment, accommodation, products, and so on. And after, the regulation do not allow you to do it. So governments and destination have to work. Yes, of course. But after, we have to think how they can do and this is what is important in UNWTO is to have those discussion at global level with all the countries because you will not have the solution in only one country so France, France can lead this movement but we have to think that people are coming from all over the world and they will travel more and you have area like Asia or Africa they will more than double in the next 10 years. So if we want to solve that, we have to speak about real figures and real situations. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that leads on rather nicely to the fact, um, just for everyone to be aware of, if you have a business, um, is uh, there's this convention, Convention of Biological Diversity, they have their 15th uh, conference of the parties in December in Montreal. It's been postponed uh, twice because of the COVID pandemic. Um, and this will bring together 196 <coughs> countries. They will be discussing the global uh, biodiversity targets mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. next 10 years. Um, and business is very much in those targets. There's two targets of 22 that are focused on business. And the key one, which I think is going to be, well, I mean, they're both fairly challenging, I think. One of them is mainstreaming biodiversity safeguards in your day-to-day -day operations and decision-making. Um, this is something that has actually come out of a declaration focused on tourism that uh, came about in 2016. Um, it was recognizing the importance of tourism and how nature is integral to its goods and services. And so it was felt by the delegation there uh, to mainstream biodiversity. The second point is about measuring impact and uh, dependency on nature and then demonstrating over time how you are minimizing that impact that you have identified. So just thinking about that, if I could ask first Michelle and then Christelle from a business perspective on hearing that, I mean, obviously you've got to wait for it to get into domestic legislation and you know, be, be enforced and so on, but hearing that a business, your business, will have to, to measure its dependency and impact on nature what do you feel about that? Well, um, clearly, we measure our impact. Uh, first, in, uh, if you are looking at Utopia, we are manufacturing our own accommodation, cabins and tents. So we have the capacity to measure and to transform what we manufacture. So this is the, the, the first point. But uh, clearly, the, the evolution of the mod economic model we have first, if we want to do it, and this is the, the main point, for the time being, people are asking the same product than in the past. They are consuming the same product. We want to transform it. They want us to transform our product, but the, they do not want really to pay more. They do not want really to change their destination. So you see, when you put uh, uh, an airline, well, the flight is full currently. And the prices have increased 50%, 60%, and double. So clearly, we have to find a solution because why companies, why the sector is going to invest to change the product if the customers are consuming the product they have. 
So we have to find a way in between governments mm -hmm. and the sector to see how we can invest to change this model and to push people to consume the right product. But we, I really think that we have to observe the demand and the change will come because we are going to change the offer. Because if you look, people are going back to the cruises, they are going back to the Spanish hotels. Do remember that Spain has 36% more hotel than France. And the first accommodation in France is camping. So we have to think about that because I do not think that the sector will really finance alone this transformation because instead of that, there is no economic model if there is not a part paid by the humanity. We have to find the solution and we have to push this transformation and we have to do it quickly because it's going to be mandatory for the climate. Thank you. And uh, Christelle, you could give an insight from a destination perspective. Actually, I can uh, bounce back on what you said. It's actually, I think, our job as a tourism board is to make the actors and the players, the stakeholders, conscious of the change. Some are more aware of it than others. Some have a business model that works brilliantly in the winter. So why would they challenge that? So, but we know that things are changing. We know that um, below 155, no, sorry, 1,500 meters might be tricky in the future to have snow. So we are going to help the professionals in our sector to anticipate those changes, to have the common tools to measure change as well, and also carry out the surveys about the customers and how trends maybe um, we need to evolve in our offer as well. We need to tackle the summer, we need to tackle also the springtime and the autumn and see what offer as an industry we can come up with to make things change and then also prove that the economic impact can be positive for uh, the stakeholders as well. So it's kind of a, a virtual circle we should get in of um, uh, con understanding the consumer, um, evolving with the offer, proving that it works, and then hopefully that green and not vi vicious but virtuous circle will work. So I think it's our role as a kind of a B2B kind of toolkit agency to help um, our destination and our territories to take that on board. Thank you. I, I, I'm going to add something. You, you know that I have a position in Nouvelle-Aquitaine as a responsible of tourism. And um, as we know that uh, we have to help companies to be able to finance, to be able to finance um, the, the, this transformation, we have created a fund, Nouvelle-Aquitaine Croissance Tourism, uh, to be able to enter in the capital of the companies to leverage debts, to be able to pay and to make this, inf this investment to help the transformation and structure the territory. And this is what we need, clearly, is to create the mechanism to finance this transformation. A absolutely. Um, just very quickly, Kit, any thoughts on that whole measurement bit? Because yeah. obviously we're not talking about carbon here, uh, we're talking about something very different. Any thoughts on that? Just very quickly, because I'm of course. with minutes left. So carbon has a, a huge advantage, right, which is there's, there's one number that we're, we're all focused on. And when we communicate about climate change, we can just talk about that number. And when businesses are approaching the climate issue, they can focus on that number and they can say, okay, well, we know we emitted this much. We know we can take these actions to, to reduce, offset, capture that carbon. It's just, it's nice and simple. Um, I think the issue of biodiversity is is the, the macro numbers are known. We talked about them earlier, um, biodiversity loss on, on, a, on a large scale. Where that isn't turned into is on, is on a, a, a kind of micro, a personal level, right? It's not possible at the moment, really, to say, as a business, um, you know, your, your 30,000 trips that your employees take every year has this effect on biodiversity, whether that's good or bad. Um, and likewise, you know, it comes through to point of sale, then you, as someone booking travel, have no idea which is the best option when it comes to biodiversity. And, and I think that's a challenge, because I'm, I'm an optimist, and, and I, I think 
most people do want to do good. And I, and I think a lot of businesses, whether it's altruistic or whether it's just selfish for marketing purposes, I think they also want to be able to say, yeah, we're, we're doing a good thing, just like they do when it comes to carbon. Um, or starting to do more when it comes to carbon. And so I, I think if we can solve this problem, then there'll be a lot, a lot more investment, um, either at point of sale or, or from businesses on more sustainable options for, for biodiversity. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, summing up, um, we need transformational ch change. I mean, society needs transformational change. So tourism has to uh, follow that too. And, um, a key point to make is that this uh, report that we did with uh, World Travel and Tourism Council provides you with all that you need to know um, about nature positive tourism, which is the term that we've called it. It provides a roadmap of four phases on how to uh, assess and define uh, your measurements and uh, build your uh, sustainability uh, your nature positive strategy, how to reduce where you can, where you can avoid, um, and how to restore nature. Uh, and then the last two phases about uh, monitoring and reporting and collaboration and communication. We didn't really get to talk about collaboration. We, we could actually have a day's discussion on this topic, but obviously 45 minutes. Um, I would advise you, if you haven't seen the report already, to go to the Animundial website, animundial.com, and you can download the, the report there. It's also on the WTTC website. And last point uh, is that uh, WTTC uh, and Anim Animundial, we will be going to that conference in Montreal, and we will be uh, working on behalf of the travel sector and this is mainly the membership of WTTC, uh, and putting forward to the conference of parties that because travel and tourism is so integral to this topic, is that there is a potential for the sector to become a guardian of nature. Uh, and we would be looking for government subsidy, we would be looking for frameworks, we would be looking for support for the sector to achieve those goals. So fingers crossed. Um, and if you're interested and you want to be involved, uh, come and find me afterwards. Thanks very much for all your time. They've been slaving away with my, all my emails going backwards and forwards with guidance and so on. So thank you so much. Thank you for um, persevering with the English language. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thanks so much. <laughs>
So hi everyone, thanks a lot for this introduction. Uh, big thanks to my friend Frédéric, Christian, for inviting me today, this morning here with you. Well, the, the purpose of my speech will be to kind of prolong the latest round table and to show you practical examples of how we can do that and switch to action for our customers and with, with each of our employees. Can you see something? Yes, very soon. You could see something. So I'll start. Okay, I'll start. We don't care. Um, my first point is obviously you know that customers' expectations are now moving on. 70% are many, many services, but globally 70% of our customers, feel free. Um, tell you that they want to travel and having a positive impact on the economy and environment. We know that. That's for sure something all of us, all of you, get in mind. We've got a significant pressure from uh, uh, all the civil society, regulation. All of this, we know that. You've heard about that for sure for two days now. But the question is, right now, how can we move to action for real? As for us at the group Pierre Vacances Center Parks, what we do is that we've got a clear commitment towards nature, environment protection, positive impact on the ground. What we do, we've got a, a very clear strategy being based on DCSR topic on three, uh, three elements. First, stepping up for real or ecological transition. It does start by ourselves and we don't want to wait for regulation or whatever. We'll start with ourselves. Second thing is that we want to really contribute to local territories and local economy to get a positive impact on them. And then third, uh, taking uh, this opportunity to engage our employees towards a new vision of society. And I think for them, that's very motivating, engaging, and that's key for us. So is it only... Um, a pitch, or is it something that we do for real today? That's the problem, you know that 8% of the emissions from this tourism area, so we love to travel, we love to discover new territories, but we know that we do impact Mother Nature and that we need to really decrease this impact. To which extent do we need to increase it? If we want to go to the minus 50% of CO2 carbon emission by 2030 and to get to minus 95% in 2050, we need to divide it by 4%, to decrease it by 4% per year. This is what we need to do. How do we do that? At group level, we made the calculation of our carbon footprint at uh, the group level. And we, you can see that each year we do emit 1.4 million ton of carbon dioxide. You'll tell me, is it big? Is it uh, small? Well, this is the equivalent of what a town, uh, a town I would say, uh, such as a, a small town as uh, Le Havre, which is the, probably one of the nicest towns in France today, uh, would emit each year with the uh, 140,000 inhabitants that Le Havre has. Um, we've got four main brands in the group and you can see how many, how much of this carbon footprint is being contributed by each of our brands. So big part is for center parks, we are European-wise 30 parks in Europe. Pierre Vacances being in France and Spain, so uh, quite a lot uh, uh, in, the, in the mountains, but also at the seaside, and Maiva with camping and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, location. How do we do to decrease this carbon, those carbon emissions um, in the next 10 to 20 years? First, there is this energy sobriety in which we are all embedded right now. To my opinion, this is just a bit as COVID. We didn't choose this energy sobriety uh, for next 22, 23. But in the end, I'm sure we learn a lot about that. Because we will have to learn how to operate our parks, uh, our different venues, with a minus 5 or a minus 10% of 
energy consumption and so carbon footprint. And you will see that uh, we will reinvent the way we do operate, the way we do welcome our customers. We don't want to affect their comfort for sure, but you'll see that this is possible just as COVID showed us that different ways were possible. So that would be the first kind of uh, compulsory a uh, passive way to do that, but decrease energy demand through energy sobriety will learn a lot to each of us. And then something that will really ask for a much stronger amount of time uh, is decarbonation, because it will imply some investment, it will imply some huge capex, and our industry needs to uh, be able to afford for those capex and investment in the long term. Obviously, it will depend on to which price is the uh, carbon tone in 10 years, 15 years. We don't know that, but we need to be prepared to that. So let's first focus on sobriety. Sobriety, it was brought on the table by the cost. Uh, when you get a multiplication of the electricity price by 5 to 10, so it depends if I looked this morning, if I looked yesterday, but globally, you get this increase. So we, all of us are affected. Um, so that's something uh, which is imposed to us, but we've got also this clear consciousness of this climate change, and we need to be an actor and to be the one acting in favor of the climate change. Rules that were said, so what we want to do at group level is I think as every uh, of you here in the room, I guess, Alexi, you'll do so uh, the same way. Globally, minus 10% energy consumption within two years, meaning minus 5% this year and minus 10% for um, the, year, um, the year after. How is it going to be done? Well, very simply, um, I would say, uh, probably the best example I could give you is that we are very present for Pierre Vacances in the mountains, close to my friend. Christelle, but she has left, so she's no longer here to, to, uh, to, to listen to me. But we are very close to Christelle in Savoie Mont Blanc, uh, in the mountains. And when you are uh, in the mountains skiing, I'm sure that when you leave your apartment, you were not thinking of decreasing the heat level of your apartment. You were just saying, I don't really pay for that. I want. I just want to be very comfortable when I will get back from my skiing journey. So I will leave it that way. If we just turn off this heating system on my side, I will just make sure that one hour before you get back to your apartment, my employees will take care about you and uh, securing the fact that, yes, the temperature is OK for you. Then you save a lot doing so. That's one example for heating minus two degrees in the different collective or private uh, locations, that's key. Um, well, when you talk about swimming pool, and we've got many swimming pools for center parks, you know that it's key, the difference between 29 degrees and 27 degrees for a swimming pool, so we care a lot about that. But for sure, heating will be key. Water will be key, as I mentioned. And light, how to uh, put some more uh, detectors, how to really switch off at night time. Everything that retail is doing will be also inspired and in doing that. So it's a question of customer action, employee awareness, and in the end, measuring, measuring the impact of that. And I think that we, we should be quite transparent um, towards our customers, just to tell them that we are facing the same problem. Uh, and it's not just uh, to put some more complexity in the travel journey that we do that, to decrease their level of comfort, but just for the sake of um, the earth, um, the comfort of each of us today and tomorrow. So I'm sure that people will switch in terms of behavior. So that's for sobriety number one, and we will measure at the end of 22, at the end of 23, to which level we've been able to decrease our consumption. Second topic is carbon emission trajectory, minus 5% per year, I told you, which means in the different scope we have, we made the calculation as I told you, scope one and two, which are in our hands, are contributing to 12, 20% of our total carbon footprint. Scope three, being mainly purchase and transportation, contributing to 80% of our footprint. So I could say, well, dear friends from uh, 
SNCF, uh, motorways, etc. Everything is in your hands, but I will first care about my 20% which are in my hands. I will try and I will commit to halve those scope one and two emissions, to, to divide the, them by two uh, by 2030. And concerning the scope three, so mainly, um, as I said, um, uh, waste, so uh, purchase, procurement, and transportation, the aim is to divide it by, uh, to do minus 30% on this scope three level. So that's very easy, you know, to claim a uh, big figure uh, and all the more as it's very far away to say, okay, I will no longer be there. So probably in 2030, 2050, I could take those commitments for my successors, but we want to take it very concretely. And so we took the whole customer journey to say, what would be the change for each of them to commit to this trajectory? Well, first, um, what does it mean in terms of how to uh, go to your destination. As I said, you can see probably on the top right side of this slide, the contribution of travel in the carbon footprint of Pierre et Vacances, Center Parks and Maiva. For Pierre et Vacances, that's 60% of the contribution. For Maiva, that's 76% of the contribution. And for Center Parks, that's 26%. Why is there such a difference? Because when you go to ski, that's for Pierre et Vacances. Uh, half of the residences of Pierre et Vacances are at the mountain. Globally, you live in Paris, you go to ski in the mountains, you take your car. That's the case for 80% of our guests today. Then this contribution is big for you. When you go to a center park, globally, a center park is 300 kilometers from where you live. You go very uh, close to your uh, location to, uh, to have your center park journey. And so this contribution of the car journey or the transportation journey is much lower. But looking ahead towards 2030, what does it mean? First, if you still take your vehicle to get there, and most people will still do so, it means that we need to cover the whole parks with recharging points for electric vehicles, for sure. We need to make sure that bicycles are here, available for everyone, because you will leave your car just arriving at the park and find it again at the end of your journey, four days, five days after, but you no longer need your car, whether you stay in Pierre Vacances or Center Parks. And the way you join your venue needs really to shift towards the railways. That's key for us. That's key that there is an interest for the customer to really come by train to us. And this is where I was previously the CEO of VoyagesNCF.com, so I quite know this, uh, this house quite well. But this is where you get a problem, because the trains are completely crowded today. I mean, if you take any train for the weekend, for at weeks, they are more than 80% occupied. So there is not a big interest, if I put myself in the shoes of SNCF, to say, okay, I will partner with you for that, because the trains are already full. On my side, on my side, Today, I really, I, um, I could not care that strong about is my guest coming by car or by train. So none of us would have a common interest in doing this shift. This is why I think that regulation could and should come really to incentivize guests to come by train more than by their individual car. That's a long-term issue, but... Definitely, I'm convinced that that's one of the ways really to help to this shift in terms of transportation. Otherwise, you don't get this common business interest among the different actors. And each one of us is making uh, some actions, taking some initiatives, but not to the level of shifting millions of people from their car to the train. And you get also the end-to-end um, really harmless journey between a train, then a coach, then a final uh, few kilometers to uh, walk through. That's point number one. Point number two is for us the accommodation and facilities. You can see the way on the top uh, left part of the slide, the way of that, quite small, 4% for Pierre Vacances, 17% for Center Parks. But we want to decrease it for sure. And the way we will decrease it is through sobriety. I mentioned about that 
a few minutes ago. And through decarbonation in the medium and long term, but that will really ask for huge investments, hundreds of millions of euros to decarbon and switch to renewable um, ways to energies to heat each of our parks and residences. That's something we will have to discuss with each of our landlords, but it will uh, imply a huge commitment on their side and our, our side. And it will depend, the interest to move to that will depend on the price of the electricity, the price of the gas in 10 years time. None of us knows this price, so we would be very inspired to invest in those renewable energies for sure. Then, since we are in France, here in Southwest, I was not at the dinner yesterday, but I, I, I know I missed something. <laughs> Thanks for that. But then you go to it. What's the contribution of this lunch uh, globally in our customer journey? 20 to 30%. 20 to 30%, what should we do uh, for that? We should really only uh, offer things purchased locally. It means that there is a selection. It means that you get a very, a very more limited offer. It means that uh, when you are uh, here in the southwest of France, you will not buy things produced in the northeast of France, being just brought to you by huge uh, trucks being on the road. But you need to assume that and to voice that to your customers. And you will see that this day, the customer will be more than happy to say, this is why I'm happy to consume it that way. This is locally produced. We should show and bring the local producer to the table and to our venues for that. But let's, let's assume that this is a choice, this is a commitment, and this is not something which is a punishment, uh, a blame for our customers. But this is their interest to say, I'm here in Nîmes, so I will eat locally what is produced by uh, a local restaurateur. That's for the catering part. And then you get all the uh, activities, obviously, all the waste management on the side, the purchases, etc. And looking ahead, that's the same way to, to reason, to say we want to uh, limit our contribution or production of waste to recycle as much as possible. And this is where we are not alone in a park. We've got many partners uh, in the park and they need to be on the same page at the same speed as we are. Otherwise, if you say, okay, but no, this is my partner, so I cannot do anything with him because we've got a contract, but uh, he's alone in and allowed to do anything that will not work. So in the end, I talked to you about the right part, which is the transportation for the customers. 80% of the emission contribution today, it needs to be decreased for sure, catering travel. And on my side, what am I committed to do? Minus 50% for all the equipment and accommodation part. Energy needs to decrease and to be divided by two. And for the new build, activities related to operation, refurbishment, new construction. Am I saying that I'm, I will no longer build new residences, new park? I don't, I really don't believe that. But I'm convinced that in the mountains, we should renovate much more than build, that's for sure. Two thirds of the beds are cold, beds uh, not being occupied more than eight weeks, eight weeks a year. That's a pity, that's a shame business-wide. Uh, environment wise so we need to really renovate more than build new uh, residences plus plus on our operation we need to commit to reduce waste and to do all those uh, uh, management to manage travel another way as it was said before so this is the long-term vision but I uh, wanted you to uh, show you very concretely and to put really meat on this uh, vision to tell you that yes, this is possible and there is really a concrete and very clear way to move towards this new ecological transition. It is speeding up for sure. It does engage our guests, it does engage our employees, but I think this is a, yeah, a collective commitment and I think that everyone is now ready to do so. Just to um, end up my presentation to you, to show you that this is done already today. We are here, not that far from Toulouse, so not that far from 
à jeun. And so not that far from the land of Gascogne. This is a new center park we did open up last May in the region Nouvelle Aquitaine that Michel was mentioning. Um, and this park, I think, is the perfect example of what I did describe to you in our vision towards 2030. Why that? Look at our carbon footprint. This whole, we've got 400 cottages there instead of the usual 1,000 cottage we've got, we would have in another park before. So we now open smaller parks with 400 cottages. Biomass for the heating system with local wood chosen in uh, an area around 40 kilometers uh, around the park, chosen by each of the local um, deciders, politicians of the center parks. We chose together where we would take this wood to uh, heat the, the park through the biomass system. No AC. We are in Agen between Bordeaux and Toulouse. You were in France or globally somewhere this summer. So you remember the temperatures this summer. We have no air conditioning in this park. Was it a problem this summer? Not at all, because we've got natural ventilation. And we do explain the reason why we did so to the customer. So we had literally no complaint even this summer about having no AC. Second thing, water. We've put in place an innovative system of purifying marshes for part of the swimming pool water, meaning that you take part of the water of the swimming pool and you bring it uh, to other parts of parts of the park where they could be used, they could, that could be, uh, for example, for the toilets of each of the cottage. But we are recycling this water, and the way we design this park and the water system was done that way, not to waste a single uh, uh, centimeter of or centiliter of water. Then biodiversity. We talked a lot about bio biodiversity. We need to decrease our impact on the, the earth, on the carbon, on the energy. But I'm convinced that for each of the projects we do develop and design today, we should have this positive impact view. How could we contribute to the local communities, to the local biodiversity, bringing a new park or new residences? This is what we've done for Pierre Vacances in uh, one of our villages to say, we don't need all those uh, plots all these, all those square meters, and so we'll take part of it uh, and we'll give it to local uh, NGO, we, which are taking care of the local bi biodiversity. What we've done in Centre Parks Land de Gascogne is, is that we created uh, local um, areas where we take re literally uh, each of our guests by the hand to take them and go and discover. What is biodiversity? What does it mean for children, for parents? None of us knows that. So they do that together. And this is probably one of the biggest USP we've got now for center parks, which is close to nature. It's no longer, I would say, the Aquamundo, the slide, etc. We want our customers to come and see us, much um, more and more numerous, for the sake of our nature commitment. And this is really uh, proving right since This is the reason why now they come and see us more and more frequently. And you see that our commitments towards local economy and local environment, um, we created uh, 300 permanent jobs with this park. Um, 80 to 90 percent of those, jo of those jobs are people who were unemployed before. And they were able to find back a job with us, only with us. Local purchases and a tourist office making the whole promotion of Nouvelle Aquitaine, Bordeaux, Toulouse. Just to show us, and uh, doing a bit of rewind, that we've got a vision for the tourism towards 2030, 2050. This is something compulsory for each of us, for our kids, but also for our business, to be clear. And the way we do that today is through a clear path around the whole customer journey. And I think that each one of us should take some very clear and concrete examples, such as Land de Gascogne, to say, yes, this is possible. This is not only a nice story, but this is what everything, everyone is living today. And I'd like to end up with the level of satisfaction of those customers having experienced Land de Gascogne. We've got an NPS above 60 
on this on this park and this is why I like since we are close to it right now to encourage each of you to come and visit Land de Gascogne. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much, Frank Gervais. That was really, really interesting. And, and also a great advert for Sensparks. That's <laughs> very good. Um, now then, after Brexit and COVID, I have several friends in the tourism and travel industry working in hotels and restaurants. And in the UK, there was a huge staff shortage. They couldn't get people to work in restaurants and in hotels. And I know hotels that that could have had 100% capacity after COVID who couldn't get the staff to actually fill, that, fill the jobs so they couldn't actually get the rooms filled. They couldn't take enough people in because they couldn't get the staff. I thought that was a UK issue. I thought it was a Brexit issue, which I think it was slightly. Um, but it seems that it's actually a global issue too. In fact, I'm going to do a conference quite soon where one of the sessions is called How to Make the Travel Industry Sexy Again in the same way, trying to get people to work in the industry. And frankly, um, I, you know, I've got kids and they don't think that hospitality is where they want to go. That is not on, on their career path. They don't even think about it. I don't think they're even told that at school. It's not seen as being a, a place to go. However, this next session is all about how we can change that perception, I think, and how we change... Uh, the idea that actually maybe tourism and hospitality is a good place to be, to work in, uh, and actually a very um, prosperous place to, to be in the future. In other words, careers can be forged in the travel industry. So, before we get on to the panel, I believe that Jill... Uh, is she there? Where is Jill? Uh, she's just oh, she's lurking on my right. <laughs> Jill uh, Sinclair is going to have a, a little conversation with Edmund Bartlett first before the panel comes on. Is that right? Yep, very good. Jill, take over. Um, thank you so much. Um, and today's um, session is really about how do we change things. And Minister Bartlett is going to give us his view, a macro view and a micro view of what the future can be. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jill. Um, I, I think we've been talking a little bit about the impact of the pandemic on the global psyche, not just now of the medical world that has really been embraced in it and, and have led us. As a matter of fact, it's perhaps the first time in maybe a few centuries where all of us were literally totally at the behest of, of the medical fraternity. And governments had to cede to the direction of ministers of health <laughs> and epidemiologists. And I think the World Health Organization had sent a stage uh, in a manner it never did before. So it created that period where all of us were in what we call the sense of uncertainty. We, we knew nothing and we understood even less. Uh, and we relied, relied heavily on science and, and data in a way that we never did before. Uh, the industry that suffered the most during this period is, of course, our industry, tourism. Uh, I had a, an experience where having had growth levels in 2019 unprecedented in, in our own history, uh, woke up one morning in March and found zero visitors on my doorstep that had all the hotels closed. Uh, all the workers, either f for long or separated, and, and some with a sense of not knowing whether that separation is permanent or it would be temporary. And indeed, what period 
uh, of temporariness would ensue. So what we had was an industry that had gone from being 10% of global GDP, of earning 7.8 trillion US dollars, of employing 400 million people, and representing 18 to 20% of the trade in services to being a zero industry. And what all of that did was to create a new sense of how do we ever, ever get out of this, or can we get out of it? Anyway, man, in his wonderful sense of being able to innovate and to pivot and to adapt, displayed those characteristics again. And we were able to have mitigation and protocols and actions which we all followed, followed carefully and well. And within two years, we are now in a period of what we call the anthropos, when we're active again, we're flying, we're moving. But what has happened as a result of that period of anthropos is a disruption, a whole disruption of both the social systems, the political systems, the economic systems, and even the environment, based on the fact that during that entrepreneur's, the environment had a chance to refresh itself, as the planes were not flying, so there were no emissions up there. The ships were not sailing, so the fish got a chance to regenerate and breathe. You know? There was no hunting in, in the forest, so the animals in the wild got a chance to reproduce and grow. And a few things good happen, but also production cease, manufacturing cease. And there was a logistics nightmare because there was no movement now of goods and services. And with the result, of course, of a recovery that has now come that is beset with a number of disruptions. And so the supply chain disruption is the number one we speak about. And within that frame, it's a human capital disruption. So Rajan made the point. The hotels are open, but the workers are not back. The planes are trying to fly, but the pilots are not back. The stewardesses and stewards are not back. And we could go on and on and on because the nature of the recovery now is being hampered by this very fact that we need to bring back the workforce of tourism. And so one of the reasons that we are talking today is to try to examine why is it that the workers are not coming back. And perhaps we need then to look at ourselves and to look at the industry prior to COVID, up to 2019. What was the employment ecosystem that obtained? Did we provide security of tenure for our workers? Were our workers satisfied in their job space? Did they have social security? Did they have the capacity to experience mobility within their workspace? Did they have the capacity for portability within their workspace? When they left the work, did they go into a community that offered them a sense of relief, or did it enable more pain and difficulty? Did we provide housing facilities for them? Did they have access to Medicare? So these are some of the conditions that we look at as we now examine why is it that they're not coming back to us. But then we need to also examine another factor, the psychosocial impact of that period. The fact that tourism is driven hugely with a gender mix that favors our women. 
60% of the workers of the tourism industry globally are women. So when you consider who the displaced were, it's our women who suffered. But they went home, and they went home to their children. And by, n by nature, they nurture. And that sense of nurture created something else within them and questioned the bond that perhaps existed between themselves and their children while they were at the hotels working. And whether this new phone missing link has anything to do with what will happen in terms of their attitude to going back to work. So all of these, once we begin to consider them, then we have to look at how to reimagine the tourism work environment. To reimagine it in terms of what are the new skill sets that may be required to enable the worker to come back to us. And who are they? What kind of job arrangements, what kind of labor market arrangements we now need to craft in order to be attractive again to the tourism worker. In Jamaica, and I give you this and, and leave you there, in Jamaica, we have looked at this because we have a 20% negative employment in tourism. So we begin to look at how is it that we have remunerated our workers. And it is true, the tourism worker pre prior to the pandemic were the lowest paid in the world. Our working conditions were the most <laughs> difficult to maneuver because we had no tenure. We were all casual workers, low skilled, low remunerated. And most importantly, we never professionalized the industry. So we never saw ourselves as being a career person in tourism. We saw tourism as a transit area where you pass through to become something else. You leave high school, you spend a few weeks in a tourism place as a playmaker or as a front desk operator or something, something on your way to becoming a lawyer, teacher, doctor or something. So how do we now change that whole uh, scenario and to professionalize the industry? So we established the Jamaica Center for Tourism Innovation, which became a pathway training and certification institute which allowed for workers who are competent on the job to be certified while on the job. And what that did was to give them an opportunity now for mobility, but also portability. The second was to look at our young people who were in high school and who never thought that tourism was a career path. But we went in now with a, a program of training and also to provide them with an associate degree in hospitality and customer service. So they can enter into the workforce with qualification, with stackable credentials. And finally, we looked at a plan for social security. And Jamaica established the first ever, and to date worldwide, comprehensive tourism workers pension plan, legislated in parliament to ensure that every single person who works in the tourism industry, whether in hotels or attractions, transportation, or anywhere in the industry, you have an opportunity to be part of a pension plan with a contributory pension scheme of 3% for you and your employer, 3%, and it gives you an opportunity to retire in grace. So these are some of the conditions I believe that if we examine and look at, might create the sexiness that Rajan spoke about and enable us to have our workers coming back. And so perhaps a charter, uh, and we spoke about that yeah, at a yes. different place, a global charter on the whole matter of employment and the, the, the ecosystems around employment for tourism might be a discussion worth having at this time. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Minister. That's fantastic. Yes, we'll go for the panel. Um, I think what we want to get out of today before I introduce the panel is really some of the deep learnings that and examples of what's been going on in, in tourism industry, but also look at the sort of the real paradigm shift. What are the things that we can actually innovate? And we're blessed with a great panel, Minister included, um, that actually shows people who are innovators, strategists, educators, 
enablers. And I think one of the things about today, I've probably had the best conversations offline about what we can do to change. So let me introduce, first of all, um, Secretary General of the Chamber of Commerce, Dragana Kota. Yeah. Um, I think what we started off with, with Mr. Butler was the context of what's go gone on. But what I want out of today is really to understand what are the issues you're facing and what are you doing about those issues. So, Dragana, you know, you, you have an amazing role because you cover everything from economic, you know, sustainable growth, you coordinate, you're involved in women's entrepreneurs and so much. But could you just tell us what you're going through in terms of, you know, talent and what is happening? Uh, thank you, Jill. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Yep, okay. Uh, well, yes, uh, it's it's hard to say something new after the ministry said a lot yeah. about the, the issues that are challenging all of us, the whole industry, but not only mm. uh, the, the tourism and the hospitality industry. It's a global issue and a global challenge for for a for, for world and for each industry, it seems. As you said, I work with, with all industry uh, because the chamber is mm. that kind of institution. And <clears throat> uh, each sector, at least in, in my country, but I believe that the situation, and I know uh, in communication with, with colleagues from other countries that the situation, situation is very similar. Mm. So there is a construction sector, transport sector, uh, metal processing, wood processing industry, etc., that are facing the same problem, lack of human uh, resource, human capital, uh, skilled workers and workers, workers in general. So what we are doing, we are focusing on, on, on um, attracting the young people uh, to uh, think about the tourism and hospitality as a future profession for them. So we started with the dual system of education in the school, in vocational and technical schools. Uh, um, uh, creating a, or uh, implementing the princi principle learning by doing. So what does it mean? It means that we are trying to um, attract young people uh, first to enroll the schools, uh, touristic schools, mm -hmm. and then to have more practice in companies companies so they can at the beginning uh, become familiar with the industry with this mm. with the sector and with the each in potential employer for them the working conditions and everything uh, also we put attention on uh, uh, adult education trying to okay. yes uh, to to um, uh, attract uh, um, uh, um, um, elder people. people yes not <laughs> elder people but uh, um, baby um, boomers or Returning to work. Yeah, returners to work. Turn, yes, yeah, like uh, to, to, to think yeah. about to change their profession, profession. or to oh, professionalize okay. in, in, in touristic and hospitality sector. Also, um, uh, there is, um, these are the uh, so-called formal ways of education and new methods and programs that we are developing. But there is also a good, excellent examples that we are working with the USID tourism project in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, you probably already heard for uh, yesterday and, and, and today what we are doing in Bosnia and Herzegovina related to tourism. But uh, what we did uh, in, in uh, past year and during this year, uh, we developed the new program um, um, that is called uh, a Pathway to Professionalism. Mm -hmm. So trying to um, uh, uh, implement the program in uh, hotels and restaurants to train people already employed there so they could become a trainers for the new employees and and employees and it's in in in, in kitchen in the uh, housing uh, housekeeping sector waiters all all okay. necessary so uh, yeah it's a dynamic learning it is and dynamic it's, learning know, yeah day to day yeah. learning yes yeah. yes yes but of course certified at the end with with recognition for the person who will go through 
enter that education uh, to feel uh, <clears throat> appreciated and to feel that yeah. there is a chance to learn more and to upgrade the knowledge. Okay. Mm -hmm. And get paid more, yes? Yes, of <laughs> course, <laughs> that, that is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the idea, I'm just going to Alexi because in a way, you've only been in the job for the last 18 months, so congratulations. Um, Perfect timing. I, what would be interesting you as an operator, um, you know, working throughout the season, you know, what are the issues you've faced with your staff, both in attracting them and retaining them? I think the, the main issue is, uh, is strengthening the attractivity of, of the industry, because after this crisis, as you described, Mr. Minister, uh, really there is a challenge in being attractive again. So the, the, the main challenges are, are people less motivated that mm. left purely and simply the industry. Uh, I have a few examples in mind, uh, people working with us for 25 years, you know, a uh, chef, it was really, really well rated, appreciated by the clients, and it just said, okay, enough is enough, I'm gonna leave, and I'm gonna work in the wood industry, in, 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 in working from eight to five, from Monday to Friday, yeah. and that's off. And, and, and this is the, the, the challenge, because during this, this crisis, people also discover the different way of living, a different rhythm, uh, rediscover their weekends, nights, and families, mm. which is fair enough, uh, but they, they also uh, consider, as you described, you attract senior people to, to, to reposition in tourism, but these, these people decide to go outside tourism as well. Mm -hmm. So this is the, one of the, the main challenges. Then the, the second challenge is really to bring back motivation mm -hmm. to deliver quality in the industry, in, in the business. And it's very difficult uh, when, you know, you can easily find a job because everyone is looking for employees. Uh, so you can decide, for example, as a seasonal worker mm -hmm. to work until the end of July. And on July 31st, mm -hmm. tell your boss, I'm off, and, yeah. and say, okay, you really think I will not take any days in August. <laughs> and then come back in August 15th and find another job next door mm -hmm. working again. So we also have to be very cautious, I think, in the next months, next years, mm -hmm. uh, to find new ways of yeah. dealing with this situation because there is such a disbalance between offer and demand yeah. that today, the, uh, I would say, the, the power is in the hands of our future employees, which, is, which is fair enough. And I think it's, yeah. it's what you described earlier in discussion. It was the opposite 20, uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, okay. so I mean, they used to be the most amazing you know, thing about working in a hotel and hospitality, traveling the world. The other thing that I think is very interesting is looking at how, you know, I was talking to Anne earlier, how the sort of Generation Zs have changed because the attitude I have as a baby boom is very different to them. And I think Anne running a global charity, you know, training 700,000, you know, people a year, is very interesting how are we adapting the market to suit these potential employees. Yes, thank you, Jill. Uh, it is an interesting um, dichotomy that we have. So we are looking to develop uh, a series of education programs which are uh, directly aimed at 16 to 19 year olds. Mm -hmm. So trying to capture young people at a point where they're discussing where they're going with their career and engaging them in with the industry. We're also looking to educate the teachers because I think it's as important mm -hmm. that teachers have an interest in delivering that education. And it's an education that uh, that we are looking to be very interactive with. It's not just sitting in the classroom. So we're developing a range of programs which we deliver through our own education platform to our students mm. um, to really, really get them to understand better the industry because they have really very little knowledge when they come into the classroom about it mm. and, and how wide it is and how, how interesting it is mm. <laughs> and diverse. And I think it's about getting them on board, but it's also about understanding the values of Gen Z because Gen Z, they're, they're much more value-driven than perhaps other generations were. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking at the industry and what the industry is doing in terms of uh, explaining those values, so the gen this generation can see what they're doing as an industry. And I think their CSR policies within the hotel sector particularly are really important to engage the Gen Z mm -hmm. in value-driven propositions for them to want to come and work with you in the first place. Okay. Um, just you know, leading on from that, we were talking about people going back and women um, returning. Um, but the interesting thing is actually the examples of how the industry is having to change. Now, Hilton did an amazing thing with FlexiPay 
um, you know, because technology takes, you know, a role here. Other people, amazing benefits. Is it in your mind um, that the industry is behind when you look at, you know, comparative companies like Meta, Apple? What's your view, Alexi? I mean, are you able to change things? Yeah, definitely we are able to change things, and I think we, we must do it. Uh, otherwise, yeah. the, the, the challenge will be massive and, and sustainable. So clearly we need to change the way we hire and, and we uh, um, explain the values. I'm fully with you there. Uh, and, and also ex explain the interest of working in a service-based industry. Mm. Um, uh, second, I, I think we should also clearly uh, give the opportunity for these Gen Z and future employees uh, that there is more than just a seasonal based job to be done in the industry. So clearly, and, and this will only touch the one that are looking mm. for, I don't even dare to say a career, yeah. but at least a place where they can work together with some you know, peers, staff, learn, yeah. train themselves, get paid for that, mm -hmm. fairly and decently paid, mm -hmm. and also um, you know, uh, spend a couple of years and find better. Mm. Uh, I think if we are able to be a place where you can access to future, I would say, high-level position, it's still a way for us as, a yeah. tourism, as an industry uh, to, to, to um, th there is a value behind. Uh, yeah. We'll be there to help people develop themselves, train, yeah. and find another job, another position with higher responsibilities, and probably help them find a way to do their own career within the tourism industry. Yeah. And I think with, with Belambra, what we have to offer is a diversity of jobs, mm. a diversity of level of responsibilities, yeah. a season, yeah. full time, and, and then just go um, one step after the other, and then also a diversity of uh, um, places to, mm. to, to, to deliver the, mm. the job. So with this diversity, there is, there is plenty of room for a career, and for a project. Mm. It's not a career, it's a project. Mm. And, and, and um, based on, on strong value, which is service-based industry. Mm. Okay. Um, just one point, and I think, you know, what, what is the percentage, Anne, of people who join the sort of hospitality as graduates versus those who go in at 18? Yes, now the research that we've done shows that approximately 80% of young people join at entry level. Um, so this is one of the reasons we're targeting the 16 to 19 year old age group across the 17 countries we work in, uh, because they're the people we really need to capture as, as a core group of young people to move into the industry. Okay. And do you find, you know, just with those young people you're attracting, is it if you've done any sort of base research, what is their perception of tourism and the hospitality industry? Have, you know, interesting for all of you to give me an idea. How do you sell it in? Yeah, that's a very, <laughs> a very good question and one that's really hard to answer in many ways. But I mean, one of the ways we, we try, because they come in with no understanding really, yeah. or very, very little. And it's how we engage with them and how we excite and attract them to see things in a different way, to, to view it from a different perspective, to say, okay, actually there is a, a career here for me, there is a job here for me. Yeah. It's not just something I would do when I finish school for two months and move yeah. on. I've, there's a life a way forward. And I think it's about how we educate and how we communicate. And they're really key mm. to getting these young people engaged. And to ground up, just asking, because <laughs> um, you're in a pivotal role because you see all the industries and a lot of cross-fertilization. Um, you know, what, what do you think are, are the things which will drive better perception of hospitality and tourism? I, I, I have to agree that I, I think that the first step is really the, the creation of a new image of, of, of yeah. the industry. That, that is the uh, precondition for, for, for everything yeah. else, to attract more people and then to create a flexibility in, in, in working yeah. conditions and everything. But that image is the most important. Uh, we have to, uh, um, um, <laughs> I have to be honest, employers uh, have to be aware of the fact that they have to uh, put the, the, the strongest effort mm. in, in, in uh, imaging the sector and imaging the conditions how to attract people. And now, for now, it is you know hard work, uh, seasonal work, uh, uh, overtime work. Oh, it doesn't work, yeah. 
So uh, the, the, the biggest um, effort is on employers, and the employers can push things in schools also. So they, there is always a big and important role of the companies and the business sector in, in educational system. They are pushing forward things. They, are, uh, they can um, uh, provide better conditions for um, these practical lessons for students, not only in the companies, but also in the schools, mm -hmm. um, um, helping schools to have a, a better equipment and good facilities for education. So I think that that image is the, the most important step now. And um, uh, it is not easy to change things. We don't like changes, no. yeah, so no. all of us. So, yeah. But there is one saying, uh, the lions are running faster and faster. So <laughs> there is no time to wait and no, to no. think maybe we can do something else. Uh, someone else will do it yeah. <laughs> much faster, much better. So the first that image and then the, the, the education, it is important to, for every, uh, yeah, I would go back to primary school. Wow. Yeah, I would go, okay. the, the IT industry do that. IT yes. industry is going to the primary school for the uh, from the very beginning, attracting kids, children, to think about how they can uh, be involved in the IT industry by creating video games, designing, blah, blah, blah. So now we have to go in tourism, <laughs> in primary schools, and, and, and showing the, the, the youngest how it could be good to work in the uh, tourism wow, okay. industry and, and so they can start to think at the very beginning of their professional orienta orientation Station. where to go, what to do. But I have to admit that the biggest challenge is on business community and the school system. So, and we, we have, we developed uh, also with USID uh, a project, uh, really great mm -hmm. results uh, achieved in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have short a tourism academy. It's online. It's free of charge and wow. it's in short cycles, you know. Yeah. So everyone can um, uh, just for, you know, interest, see what is happening, what they can learn, why it is interesting to be in tourism and hospitality and travel and uh, uh, touristic operators, uh, whatever. Uh, we need new uh, professions. We need um, uh, uh, rafting skippers. We need uh, hiking uh, yes. guides. It's a huge field of new professions, of new challenges, new knowledge. We have to show to the kids that they can do yeah. that also. Okay, so it's, it's a real shift in terms of perception, but almost inside the world of tourism hospitality. Definitely. Which is, yeah. And Alexi, just back to you. Have you as you've gone in, because your background is in strategy and transformation. Um, have you been brave in anything you've done, or are you basically trying to get the business <laughs> back no, on its feet in terms I, of... I think we can also work on very uh, short-term effective yeah. actions. Um, let, let me give you an example. Um, there is a massive challenge, especially yeah. in the food and beverage you know, yeah. employees. Um, there is one way to be more attractive beyond pay. It's just readapt and rethink the product you sell as an, an hospitality player, especially in the restaurants, bars, and so on, uh, and, and to reposition the product to make sure that you only have one shift per employee per day. Oh, okay. So you, you, you'll bring a longer breakfast, yeah. a different way of serving lunch, yeah. and then the full staff to really work on the preparation and the serving of the dinner. Through this reorganization of the product and the reshuffling of the different components of the FNB offer mm. uh, for the day, then people will work six or seven hours in a row with no break in between. And, and they can do something else in the morning or they can you know, have some time off and not be just full day, two hours here, two hours there, a break and some waste of time I I inside the day. So, it needs also, as Frank said earlier, uh, regarding uh, sustainable development and, and impact, um, to communicate to the client and to, to explain also why we are pushing these changes in the offer, in the product, why we are changing our touristic offer, tourism offer, uh, but I'm sure most of the clients will, will support that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it will help us to be more attractive uh, for employees. Uh, because we also facilitate the way people will, will, will deliver the job. Fantastic. I, I would just add that, we, uh, that, that communication is so important. We, we have to communicate among each other. And it is very important to communicate with the, with the employees about 
each mm. changes that are planning in in the system in the operation and in the business but uh, uh, what what is good to use uh, we have this uh, digital transformation new mm. technologies everything is viral so whatever mm. is said or showed or created it is already on internet yes. globally uh, accessible so um, I think that we missed good examples you know short storytelling yes. we miss storytelling so uh, to, to push employees satisfied employees in front they will share it they are good stories, they will share it via yeah. internet, we are all social mm -hmm. media and everything. And that is the cheapest and the, the, the most effective way to have a b big audience. And to spread the word. To spread the so word, in, yes. So just to sort of look at three, th or one thing I want from each of you is, what's the one thing that you would want to change tomorrow? And is that communication your thing then? Communication, definitely. Yeah. So we have to be clear what we want and how we are going to do that. And for that, we need communication. Yeah. <laughs> and we also need to train everyone yes, along the, yes, along the yes, line. Yes, yes, yes. It's very important. And yeah. creating the goals is already a learning, a learning yeah, process. Exactly. So, and then we will learn how to, how to implement all yeah. that. So we become more resilient. And right, one thing you're going to change. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think following on from Minister Bartlett's announcement, I'd like to see a working group to really deliver that strategy, to make it happen to be actionable, yeah. um, I, and I think that could be a very powerful thing to do. Yeah. And probably um, on my side is um, reducing the number of uh, season-based employees to full-year employees. Yeah. Uh, as we are operating in winter and summer, yeah. making the, you know, the, uh, providing the ability to, to provide a full-time job all year round is something that will help us you know, yeah. be attractive, be stable, be better in quality because, of course, people will be more on board Absolutely. and knowing the customer, the site better. Yeah. And, and this is for me a challenge. And last year we uh, switched 50 season-based employees to permanent staff. It's, it's, it's a signal and, and we want to go uh, far beyond. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I think one of the things we've got to um, congratulate everyone here is that they're innovators oh, yeah. and let's, let's keep this working party, let's get it going. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much now. Um, we have, um, by the way, one amazing thought was children at school serve each other. That, at primary school, that is a very good way of inculcating the whole idea of service culture. Good thoughts. Um, <laughs> talking of which, <laughs> talking of which, it is now lunchtime, so let's go and serve ourselves some food and come back 2.45 in the main uh, area and the Novotel, and you can watch me being grilled, another food uh, thing, uh, food analogy, being grilled about the media's role in travel and sustainability. So there you go. See you soon.